Good afternoon, Q Church, and welcome to Our House. Whatever's been going on in your world this week, we are here together tonight to continue our quest for faith, hope, and love. This Wednesday night at IQ, we'll be getting together in the back hall for an Engage night. So come along and we'll catch up with each other's stories and hear what's been going on over the summer. Doors open at 7.15pm, entry is free and everyone is welcome. If you are a guest with us this afternoon, then it is fantastic to have you here. If you'd like to stay in touch with what's going on here at Q Church, then you can subscribe to our free text messages by simply texting your full name to 07852 622 101. You'll also find a Welcome to Our House card on the pew in front of you, which you're very welcome to fill in and hand in to a steward. Now, when it comes to maintenance here at Q, can we fix it? Yes, we can, but only if we know it's broken in the first place. So, if you spot something that requires some attention around the building, then please drop us a text to 07872 or email us info at qyork.co.uk. Thank you. Now, a big thanks goes out to everybody who's made the shift to donating to Q online. Online donations are so much easier to process, so if you'd like to support all we're doing here as a community, then the simplest way of doing that is to hit the donate button at qyork.co.uk. If you'd like to make a donation this afternoon but haven't got set up online yet, then you can use the black and white envelopes in front of you today, and we'll take a collection later on this afternoon. There are some dates for the diary that you won't want to miss. We are planning a Halloween special for Sunday the 27th of October and Christmas at our house will be on Sunday the 22nd of December this year. These are always unforgettable nights that we don't want anyone to miss out on. So have a think about who you want to invite along. After the final song this afternoon, there will be drinks and snacks served in the foyer and we'll have half an hour to relax and chat over a cuppa, whilst our 5 to 11 year olds have 30 minutes of fun and games with our Life Zone team. Now, the chances are most of us are here this afternoon because on some level we're all on a quest, exploring life's big questions and looking for answers and guidance. So today we're going to explore how we know which way to go on this quest and how to spot the signs along the way. So be prepared to be inspired as we set off on a quest for direction.
Right. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, there's a, quite a few away on holiday and hope they're having a great time. But it's good that you're here. And uh, this came up uh, this week on my Facebook, just in the blue, by the blue, really. Trust my nudges, the universe. And I thought, whoa, that's awesome. I like that. Trust my nudges. So I decided, uh, along with Danny, that we were going to just put that on. Um, in between everything, because I think we maybe need uh, to get that into our spirits, to trust my nudges. Um, that clip's interesting because there was a lot of nudges going on, but he didn't trust them. He certainly wasn't going to take any notice of them. And uh, ultimately, we can be asking for signs, and we're getting them <laughs> loud and clear. Um, and we're not just talking about good stuff, we're talking about warnings as well, things that could help us uh, maybe avoid certain things, but are we listening? No. And things that could take us into wonderful blessings, are we listening? Often no. So tonight we are going to look at this sort of thing. Now what was interesting, after the uh, meeting last week, a couple of people came and, and um, after what Anth had said about various signs, you know, that we'd been experiencing, they came and said, do you know this and do you know that and do you know the other... And so we felt that maybe that was just a sign that we were meant to look at this tonight. So I hope it encourages you, because maybe if you sat for a minute and just had a thought of some of the incredible things that have happened in your own life, where you, you were shown a particular thing and it came quite remarkably and um, it was very significant in your life, I think you'll maybe enjoy that little bit of uh, reminiscing to see where that, those things have happened in your life. So... Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, okay. Um, a few years ago, um, a, a young girl came to stay with us in the apartment next door. And uh, I'd never met her before. Anth had met her father, and, and unfortunately, she'd just lost her mother and was going through the whole bereavement of that uh, just as a sort of a, a early 20s person. Um, her mother had died of cancer. And um, she came just, she was on a tour around uh, the, uh, Europe, and she came to stay at the apartment. And uh, what was interesting was, every time I looked at her, all I wanted to call her was Island Girl. Now, I know that's weird. I mean, I don't look at any of you and think, oh, you know, Island Girl, or even a name that's sort of as equally descriptive about anybody else. Um, but every time I looked at her, I just wanted to call her Island Girl. And I didn't know her proper name, although I was told it. Her name was Hillary. But in fact, I couldn't remember Hillary. All I could remember was Island Girl. Now, I know this seems really odd, but I'm just using it to, uh, just to help you. Sometimes the things that come into your mind are actually very prophetic. And we've always been prophetic as a house. As, a, as, as a, a community, in that we, we do believe God speaks in these wonderful ways. Anyway, after a little while, I thought, I've just got to basically to have the guts to say, look, I'm really sorry, but every time I want to talk to you, I'm almost going, you know, trying to remember a name. I said, it's because I want to call you Island Girl. And it sounds really daft and you feel a bit stupid, but her eyes filled up with tears and she said, would you believe that was my earliest nickname or, a, or an affectionate name that my family gave me when they lived in, the, I think it was the Dominican Republic or one of these South Sea Islands. And uh, she lived there with her, with her parents early on. 
And that was the name that she was called. So when I mentioned it to her, it wasn't me just being clever or giving her, it actually did something in her spirit that said somebody cares about me and sees me. Now you might think things like that are insignificant. You might think, well, what, what does it do or how does it help the world? I think if we were all a bit more aware, we could actually relieve some pain and suffering and drop a little uh, speck of hope into somebody's life just by listening and being aware of some of these signs. Now, let me just finish by reading this. So as I say, that thing came up, trust my nudges. I thought, yeah, that's great. Um, And and I'm thinking that's a nudge for me. Um, But this came up as well and I wanted to read it. Sometimes we have a strong sense of what our destiny is calling us to do, but we don't feel quite ready or brave enough to answer the call. We need a push, an intervention, a serendipitous stroke. You might call that fate bait. (laughs) Interesting uh, phrase. Something that will bring clarity, meaning and purpose to the panoply, don't even know what that means if I'm honest, and trajectory of my life thus far and allow and enable me to do that which I feel I cannot do. Trust my nudges, uh, the universe says. And so we keep finding clues if we're looking, uh, ephemeral bits and pieces that get our attention, that lead us to the next clue. And I love this phrase, like cosmic breadcrumbs. Oh, I thought it was lovely because you remember the story of Hansel and Gretel, how they left little pieces of bread to try and find the way home. But of course, that was a good idea until the birds come along and then, of course, steal the bread. But I like the idea of cosmic breadcrumbs that are scattered, that if I'm watching, I might be able to just follow them and find my way. And he went on to say this, that little insistently whispering voice inside, the person, place, thing that snags your attention, the song you can't get out of your head, that uncanny sense of deja vu, the sensation, disorder, addiction, affliction, disease that has no rational explanation, the out of nowhere inspiration, the dream that you can't quite wake up from, the magnetic pull in the heart and solar plexus, the third time you hear a song, a phrase or see an image, when your gut says against all odds, yes. And I just thought that was really helpful tonight in what we're talking about. So we're going to have quite a bit of cue without you tonight because we've got people who are going to participate in that. But before further ado, we'll move on. Okay? Um, Those two movies that we've just seen clips from, um, Bruce Almighty and and, um, Evan Almighty, um, you know, the first one there, there's the whole thing, give me a sign, and then he overtakes a truck that has all the stop, don't go any further, detour, on the back of it, and then, of course, there's, you know, Evan with his, uh, with his Genesis 6, 14, and uh, the go forward, I love that, the, the name of the delivery company, go forward, brilliant. Um, all, all issues about... This, this whole thing of, um, of nudges and, and the things that we could and should be aware of, and, and very often, sometimes, if you take some of those indicators from the films, we are resistant to because we don't know quite where to place it. Now, for me, there's something quite comforting about the idea of a God who nudges me. And uh, I could keep you for a long time with, um, you know, with just individual specific stories. I shared a few just last week, just, you know, little bits about our Salt Lake journey. But I, I could give you a lifetime of those illustrations. Now, of course, those, those nudges, whether you want to use the word universe or God, you know, I, I would probably use the word God. They, they can be resisted. And, uh, you know... Particularly if I have no room in my life for the idea of a bigger plan. Now, when I, when I use the term bigger plan, I, I'm not talking about the idea of a preordained set of things that have to happen. I, I, I don't believe that. But what I mean by a bigger plan is that there is more going on than meets the eye. And I think the problem is, and, and probably the great sadness, and 
um, usually to our detriment is because we do not recognize that there's more going on than meets the eye, we miss things that would give direction in our life and give us encouragement and help in our life that might save us from a lot of the anxieties and hardships of life. Some of my great regrets in ministry is when I've known stuff about people, which happens quite a lot, and then you have the courage to tell that person what it is that you've known and seen, and that person resists and rejects that, and then you see what it was that you were trying to help them avoid happen, and that, that's a great sadness. It's not, a, it's not a, an ego polisher for, well, I knew that was going to happen. It becomes a great sadness because of these nudges, but those nudges are also positive. I mean, the direction of my life, I can honestly say I can point to a response to nudges, God's nudges, whether it was for my parents, with my parents, getting me here, all of those things that go along. Now, now there, are, there are countless biblical accounts of the nudge that's often described in biblical terms as the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord came to, they're, they're those nudges, and sometimes when we're reading in Bible, we can disassociate ourselves because we're thinking, you know, some great, booming, very low register male voice spoke out of heaven and the ground shook, and that was the indicator. But I don't think it mostly was like that at all. I think, I think those nudges came in the way that we have nudges. Sometimes that inner voice, sometimes that's just, just knowing in the head, like Chris with Island Girl, just those knowing things that have happened so many times. You know, one of those is, is I find interesting because there's a... Uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 17, there's a great story about prophet Elijah, who in a time of famine and, uh, and drought, he has a nudge, and the nudge says, there's a, there's a brook in a valley near Zarephath called the brook, brook Cherith, and you need to go there. It just has some inspiration in him. Well, what he found was this is the only brook in the country that hadn't dried up. He said, well, what about people who didn't go to the brook? I don't know. You're asking me questions. I don't know. If I was Elijah, I'd just be glad that I heard that and I got to the brook. The other interesting thing in a time of famine, I don't know how true it is. It's true to me. But ravens come with meat from the pickings that they've had and they give up the meat to Elijah. So, so the, the principle of the story is that the nudge will put you where there's water and the nudge will put you where even the things that would not give up the food that they have will give up that food for you in provision. Then he meets this woman down there who's got just enough oil and just enough grain to bake a cake and says, you need to bake a cake for me. Cut a long story short, the cake she bakes never runs out. And again, some of you might struggle to believe this. Well, you know, I, I, I believe it, but even just as a principle, it's quite amazing that these are the nudges that take us to these places. Now, Nudges can also be things that bring regret in our lives. I mean, give you one nudge that brought regret many years ago. When I was but a very young man, um, I'd, I'd managed to uh, destroy a motor vehicle, as many young men have uh, expressed their skill in doing that. And uh, out of great kindness, Jim and Mavis Miller, who, who are part of this house, were extremely kind to me in that process. Jim even let me get back behind the wheel of his car, which is very gracious and very kind, you know, to an 18-year-old. Um, but also they were kind enough to get us into church. And I remember one day being in the car and, uh, and we, were, we were driving down towards Gillygate and, um, and uh, the, the, uh, there, was a, there was a young man walking down the street. Now, I knew this young man. One, this young man's name was Philip. I don't know his other name, but I knew that I knew him from some young guys who'd been in the church at some time previously. And I recognized this guy, and a voice inside of me, clear as day, said, Get Jim to stop the car and take this guy with you tonight to church. Well, I didn't have the courage, the confidence or whatever to do that. The next day, it was in the paper that that night, that young man had gone and taken a drug overdose and was now dead and wouldn't have that opportunity that might have been there. Now, I don't think God the divine holds me responsible for that young man's death. 
I don't believe that young man's death was my fault, but, but I have spent a lifetime wishing that I'd had the courage and the confidence to take that nudge that was coming that way because maybe Philip might still be here, maybe Philip might still be alive, maybe Philip might be doing something great with his life. So it works both ways, but we want to encourage you tonight to understand there is a nudge to the wider picture of the unseen that you cannot see and the nudge is all about that, which is why that slide uses universe, because it's trying to broaden our understanding that outside of our tiny little world and our tiny experiences, there is a much bigger thing that's going on, not just in the seen world, but in the unseen world. Now, let me just say one other thing before I uh, shut up for this, this thing. Uh, and again, you know, the others are going to give their story. Maybe this will touch some tonight. I couldn't get out of my head today the whole concept of the compass and how a compass is used to navigate because the compass magnetically should point us to north in the right direction. I told you last week that what's interesting, for the first time in 360 years, the needle of a compass will point directly at true north, which it hasn't done for 360 years because the issue with the, with, with, with the compass is that magnetic north which is different to true north. We have true north, where the North Pole is, and magnetic north. And the problem is most compasses are drawn to magnetic north because of the magnetism. And uh, if you want to know why, it's because it's created by movement deep within the Earth's crust that creates a magnetic field that draws the point of the compass. The, the problem is that when those movements are in a certain way, they attract or draw the needle away from reading true. And it's giving a reading, but it's not truly pointing you in the right direction. Now, all I wanted to say very briefly about that is there are lots of things from the inner core of us as people that are pulling at the compass needle to get us off true north. Now, in biblical terms, the Apostle Paul called that the flesh. And I think, I think the church has taken that phrase and made it mean many things that Paul never meant it to mean. But what he meant was the turmoil, the stirring, the stuff that goes on inside that draws the compass needle just a few degrees off where it needs to be taking us. And the problem comes when we try to orient our lives in response to the inner turmoil. That's what the compass of our lives does. So we're trying to fix the turmoil inside, but by doing that, our needle doesn't necessarily point us to true north. It doesn't take us to find the real existence of God or the kindness and love that he has for us or who we truly are in the context of this world. So I believe focusing your attention towards God actually gives you the true north. I think we all need that. And, and I didn't say towards church. I, I, you know, I didn't even say focusing your attention towards the Bible or even when people say the God of the Bible because 30,000 plus denominations tell you that within there, there are thousands of ideas about how to interpret the Bible and the concept of God from that. I mean, in your heart, looking for to find the divine that's there, that's bigger, that's more, so that within that, your compass needle can find where true north is. Not as a reaction to anything, but as a focus for anything. So I pray tonight that your compass will find north as you get those gentle nudges.
Okay, good. Um, right, I have the privilege of giving you a couple of stories, or one main one, but I might cheekily slip another one in. Um, so about 12 years ago or so, Amy and I were looking for somewhere to live. Um, we've been engaged and we're kind of looking around for a house, and we decided we wanted to be kind of in the Clifton, Cliftonmore, Rawcliffe kind of area. I don't even remember why, but I think we both kind of had that uh, nudge <laughs> that we just felt that that would be where we wanted to be. So we had a look at about 15, 20 different houses. Um, and then at one point, we went to look at a house in Clifton on Kingsway North. Clifton had a bit of a reputation. Um, any Cliftonites in tonight? Or are they not around? Hey! Um, so uh, we walked into the lounge of this house, up the steps, through the door into the lounge, and I spotted this picture above the fireplace, which looked like that, kind of a big tree and a river. There's like a house on the right and as soon as I saw it, it was just like, poof, blew my mind. Um, you might think, well, it's not that impressive of a picture. It's about this big. It's like a dark, old kind of oil painting. Well, that is the picture at the top of the stairs in my mum and dad's house that I walked past every single day of my life growing up for, yeah, 20 years probably. I walked past that picture every single morning. It's identical. The frame is slightly different, but literally, and I've never seen it, anyone else ever seen that picture anywhere before? Uh, I know, weird, eh? So uh, that just blew my mind. Um, do you know, I still wasn't convinced that that was the house for us. I was like, oh, there's probably something better out there. But um, I guess looking back now, it was a nudge. We ended up living in that house. Um, was that God? I don't know. It's one of those things you can't really say, can you? Because why does God show someone a painting of which house to live in in Clifton? But he could say, but he didn't stop the Twin Towers or he didn't stop my friend getting this illness or whatever. And I think I've definitely probably moved towards that. Well, none of us know. Maybe God doesn't say anything because, hey, if he did, he'd stop everything horrible happening, wouldn't he? So maybe he doesn't talk at all. But I think sometimes we need to kind of keep those things in balance. A lot of the things we talked about recently about the who knows we'll see. Maybe we'll miss out on a ton of stuff if we just get so cerebral and logical on things that we shut out the possibility that there could actually be a divine inspiration behind the universe, that maybe there is some kind of intelligence behind it all. And if there is, maybe that intelligence wants to influence me. Now, I believe that whatever God is and whatever that power is, is rooted in love. And if it's rooted in love, it can't 
force me to do things, can it? Like, if I love you, I'm not going to be like, cook me dinner and make you do it. But you, you can ask people, you can invite. Love invites, it nudges, but it doesn't force because then it's not love. We'd all be robots, wouldn't we? So maybe God, within his limitations that he has given himself because he wants to be love, the most he can possibly do is like, just give us these little nudges and inklings. Now, maybe we miss them a lot. Um, and I was thinking when Anth was talking, we talk about these stories from the Bible, like Elijah or an angel came to Mary, and you kind of think, sounds a bit far-fetched, like, what are the chances of that actually being true? Which I think is why it's really important that we share these nudges when we get them, because actually, like you talk to Anth and Chris and the stories they have, and I've, I've got a ton of stories like this as well, and you think, well, Maybe life's meant to be a little bit more far-fetched than it is. Maybe it's not all just straightforward like that. If I can just squeeze one extra little one in. Just before we got married, uh, we needed a car. I didn't have a car. And we didn't really have much money. Um, Anth was saying that he spotted somebody, the Philip guy, walking down the street. And then he kind of thought, ah, oh, if only I'd followed that nudge, then the guy might still be alive. Um, what that kind of triggered in me is sometimes we can go, well, that's just unfair. And maybe God just gives this one nudge and that's it. Um, if there's anything about God that I can come to as an assumption, it would be that he does everything he possibly can. Like, and maybe we've, we've pushed the fact that, well, he didn't do that, didn't do that, didn't do that. But I reckon he must do everything he possibly can. The example I'd give is um, I needed a car, and someone came to me and said, God told me to give you a car. But I said no for, for some different reasons, and it was kind of completely understandable why they said no, but they said and so I thought, kind of just wanted to let you know, in exactly the same week, someone else came and said, oh, God told me to give you a car. Now, it's, it, I don't know what all that is about. It's a mystery. But if it could say anything to me is maybe there aren't just these one nudges and maybe the universe doesn't hang on my ability to do that or my responsibility to follow the nudge. Whatever God is doing, whatever these nudges are, I'm sure there are multiple ones. If you choose to receive the nudge, and go with it, then I'm sure that will be fantastic. If you don't, don't think the whole universe rests on you and live in shame because you didn't follow that nudge that you had. Follow it, I'm sure something great will happen. If you don't, maybe something great will come to somebody else. But I believe that whatever God is, is more than enough to cover it all, and love will cover it all. So I believe it's my pleasure to introduce the lovely Claire Palmer. Where are you, Claire? Passing the bat on. Hello, I'm Claire, for those who don't know me, watching online. Um, so last week, I was one of the people who came up to Anth afterwards and said, wow, that was amazing, you don't realise the relevance of what you just said. Now, he was talking about dry bones living at the end of the meeting. He was sort of prophesying and, and saying if any, it, you know, it might connect with anyone on here. It was a bit of a message of hope. Now, it wasn't particularly what was being said at that time that meant something to me, but <laughs> interestingly... It was 12 years ago, literally to the day I've checked, and it was the 1st of September 2007, Amp stood on this stage and he preached about dry bones living. And fast forward to 12 years, it was the 1st of September, he was talking about it last week. Now, to some people that's not relevant, but to me it was amazing because my brother passed away 12 years ago around that time and his funeral was the Monday after Amp had talked about this. And it really struck a chord with me. It really meant something to me. And at his funeral, I turned to him just before we said goodbye. And I said, may your dry bones live. And, and it was just a really significant moment for me in, in what was a really horrible time. And, and it just brought me some sort of comfort. And then to hear that 12 years later, because it's obviously the anniversary, which is always hard. And, you, you know, <laughs> the longer it goes, the kind of worse it feels, because it feels like you're moving away from it. But it, it was just a real comfort to kind of hear that and recognize that, wow, that was actually 12 years ago. So for me, that was a bit of a nudge of just a reminder that of myself, actually, and the journey I've come in those 12 years and how, you know, for me as well, personally, the dry bones have lived. You know, I've, I've, <laughs> my life's changed dramatically since that point. Um, so as the week's gone on, I've been thinking it over and, and Chris had said, oh, would you mind sharing about that tonight? And I was like, yeah, sure, but I wasn't quite sure how I was going to relate that to anything else. And then I've been mulling it over because I know enough to know that something will come to me. 
And then, lo and behold, yesterday, uh, George was meant to be at a party. And to cut a long story short, I wasn't sure if I was taking him or not, but I ended up taking him. And a friend of mine, Leonie, was there, who's going through a particularly difficult time at the moment. And, we, and there was no one else there at the party that I knew, just her. So we decided to grab a chair, grab a coffee, and sit and have a chat. And it just turns out that she needed to have a chat. And so we had this long conversation, and I talked to her about you know, where she was at, and I gave her some guidance. And then later on that day... She messaged me, she actually said, not knowing anything about tonight, she said, I don't know if this sounds a bit airy-fairy, but I feel like somehow you were meant to be there today to talk to me. And, and it just made me, made me smile, because I thought that was her nudge, that actually, you know, I was there for her, and that was her nudge in order to see things in a different way. And, and it got me thinking about your consciousness and how sometimes it's about opening your consciousness to other things because I don't know about you but sometimes when I'm looking to buy a car I suddenly see that car everywhere I look or like if you're pregnant you suddenly see like loads of pregnant people and that's kind of a bit of a, a loose example but to me it was about it's about making you more aware and and for me like particularly with Leone for example when you're going through times of stress and trauma I feel like you're almost extra sensitive to stuff and your senses are sometimes more aware because you're so desperate to kind of have a sign or have something to give you some hope that you can be a bit more acute to this stuff. But I think maybe that's not an accident and maybe that was the design. Maybe it was a design that once our senses are open to this stuff that you suddenly, it just opens your eyes up to a different world. And it was kind of what I was trying to say to Leone. I was like, what you have been through, as horrible as it is, you know, the example I was trying to connect with my life is that beautiful moments come when there has been a collateral beauty. And so for me, when sometimes you're going through this stuff that's horrible, and I hate the phrase everything happens for a reason because I don't believe that in the slightest, but what I do believe is that sometimes a reason can come out of everything. And that and actually, in her life and in what I've been through, I could share with her that I see life in such a different way now and that she's actually starting to do that and that actually there can be a beauty in everything and then you start to see this world, this new world opening up to you, which is just beautiful. And, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of sad that it takes stuff like that to do it, but in that rawness, it's kind of where you, your eyes just suddenly open. And I think because quite often we can be ticking over quite comfortably or totally caught up in the rat race and everything's just coming at you from a thousand miles an hour and it's almost like you can't see the wood from the trees and you're just looking around at your feet. But I think sometimes it's about taking a breath, opening your eyes, just giving yourself a minute and just going, whew, and just seeing the world anew and seeing things differently. Because if you look up from the floor, I think you might start seeing these little truths and nudges because... That, to me, is divine. That, to me, is the divine intervention that we're talking about tonight. Like, whatever that might be to you, the stars aligning, whatever, God. It, to me, it's that divine that shows you that there's something greater and that there's a love, and that love will always win, that no matter what you've been through, God's there to show you, I'm here, and there's love, and it wins. And, and I think within that, you can move towards a greater peace. So that's my nudge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for hearing me tonight. Um, it goes back a few weeks, actually, when Anth was preaching, and I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the text, but it was just the contents of what he was saying and the points that he was making that really stuck with me, rather than what, you know, the, the, the scripture was. He was saying that there are times when in, in writing the Bible, they put a full stop where it should have been a comma. Because it makes such a difference. And, you know, as he said that, it just hit me, it came back, to me, um, it would be back in the beginning of April when I was very, very ill. I was on my own and um, 
I didn't know at that time that I had four serious, um, you know, disabilities and illnesses, four of them that were very serious. One, one was the heart, and my heart wasn't working properly. I had a clogged up chest, I couldn't breathe. I had very severe uh, kidney problems. Um, and I only just found out the other day from my daughter-in-law, because doctors tend to speak to family. They don't tell you anything, <laughs> which is a bit silly. But um, it's, my daughter-in-law said to me, do you realize, she said, that um, w the, the doctor spoke to us in the hospital. And she said, they said, I was that much away from, you know, them not being able to do anything Why? at all. Just send her home, you know. And, um, but it took me back because on that, I had a particular night where I didn't sleep at all. This was when I was at home. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I knew I was terribly ill. Um, and I was frightened because I couldn't breathe properly. Um, and uh, I started to cry. <laughs> and I, I started to cry. To, I cried to the Lord and I said, will you please take me out of this? I can't stand anymore. I've had enough. I've had enough, one thing and another. Please, I want you to take me. Will you do that now for me? <laughs> um, we do some funny things, don't we? Uh, I should have known better because I know that he loves me. I know that he would never leave me or forsake me. But when you get to that level, you know, it really gets to you. And you wanted and a full stop, didn't you? I, yes, I, I was trying to do what Anne said. Put a full stop. That's it. Full stop, Barbara gone. Out of it all, you know. <laughs> but it's turned out to be just a comma. <laughs> That's the point. That's what, what hit me. It's turned out to be, I thought, well, God hasn't finished with me then. We haven't. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't that lovely? So, that, yeah, I just wanted to, to say that because it's so easy when these things, you know, when illnesses come, it gets you down, 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 uh, and especially when you get a lot at the same time. Um, but I realise now, God hasn't finished with me. I believe I may have a chance where I am in, in Ivy Lodge um, because there's a girl there She's, she's one of the carers. She's a member of Elim. M many of us know her know her here. They call her Jean. And she has a, a little service going there. She has her own meeting and gets all the people, because they're all very old, you know, in there. I'm a baby, 80. <laughs> I really am. Uh, we had a lady yesterday, 98. It was her birthday. <laughs> so my mind goes into significance, really. Um, so, um, yes, uh, with, uh, what was I saying? You're living in the comma. Right, I'm living in the comma. <laughs> she wants me to speak. One, one, one of these little awesome. meetings. Awesome. I said, yes, I will. I haven't done it for a long time. But I said, yes, I will. Because I've got something to say. Yes. And um, I know that the, the, they're all, as I say, very elderly. A lot of them do go to church. But I'd like to go and just give them the word of God that has helped me. Yeah. I'm not going to preach a great long... No. I couldn't do it, not now. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to go and I want them to know what I've come through and how God has brought me through, how he's faithful, and he, he does amazing things that we can't even imagine. And I want to try and get some of the real truth. The probably, a lot of them, they're just churchgoers. You know, they're, they're not getting anything. 
and I, I really would like to be used by the Lord to give these people peace in their heart. They're, they're all nearing the end of their lives. They just need that bit of truth to, to come. And I'm hoping that I can do that where I am now. So I, it's better to have a comma. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm so glad that Claire mentioned that phrase that so often people use that everything happens for a reason. It's a stupid phrase. And if you have suffered loss, if you've suffered pain, if if there have been irreversible issues that ripped your heartstrings and somebody comes and tells you, oh, it's okay, everything happens for a reason when you lost a child or something like that happened, it's like, it's like punching you in the face rather than lifting your spirits and, and I don't hold to that. Nor do I hold to the church version of that which I was raised with and fed on that God is in control. I've said many times if God is in control, he's doing a rubbish job. And I understand Evan's feelings when he said, if there isn't going to be a spot of rain, I'm going to be so... You know, I do not believe that God is in control. What I do believe, though, is that God is involved. The world could not be what it is if God was in control. We could not be who we are if God is in control. But somehow in this divine thing... There is the freedom and the liberty for us to be who we are, to shape our world, to make decisions and choices in our lives without the interference of some, some divine big brother that ultimately controls everything we do. But the issue is within that, allowing us to walk in our lives, we have the opportunity to be an expression of something that in many ways is far more powerful. It's when we connect with the involvement of God, with the involvement of the divine, and something comes out of that. You know, in that, in that movie of Evan Almighty, of course, he's, he's the Genesis 614 was build the ark. And of course, it's modern day America and he, he builds the ark and he can't stop his beard growing and you need to watch the movie. It's, it's a hoot. It really is good. But then when he's finished the ark, um, you know, he's, he's, of course, he's asking, can we not even just have one raindrop, just a little precipitation? And the truth is, it, it, if you watch the next bit of that, it begins to rain and he thinks, yeah, it's come. And then the clouds blow over and it stops. And uh, he is so disappointed, and they are, but, but if you listen to the words in there when they were talking about whether they'd got it wrong, uh, I can't remember whether it was the kid or the wife that says, no, there's something else. And the whole issue of the nudges that come is that in the midst of everything that we face, we have this nagging thing that says, no, there's something else. And when we allow that to be part of our life, the truth is, into the midst of all that we're doing comes something that we cannot explain, and it doesn't always free us from what it was that we were facing, but out of that and through that and beyond that, there is always something else. The truth is, we talked about seasons the other week, and, and winds will change, and tides will shift, and, and seasons will come and go. But I think there are three constants in all of that. These are the three constants. God's love, which never changes. Your significance, which might surprise you. You are significant. You are significant. That's why these nudges are important. You are not an accident on the face of the universe. You are absolutely significant. And the third thing is a shared purpose because I don't believe that we were ever meant to live life independently or just lost in God, but that the two things were supposed to come together so that in that shared purpose, we could see that there is something else that those nudges push us to where we are going. They were thinking rainstorm. God was thinking dam burst. And what happened was much bigger than they could have ever imagined. A greater sense of purpose, a greater thing that was going on. One last little story. I, I remember uh, being by the side of my father's bed and he was dying of cancer. And you would say the ultimate thing would be that dad didn't die of the cancer. Um, ultimately he did, he died from the, the, the metastasized cancer. But what was interesting in this whole thing of muddling through all this stuff, you know, of, of, of being by his bed. I remember uh, as I was there a couple of days before he died, and some of you have heard this story, 
as I'm sat there in the room in the hospice, I was very conscious that two guys walked in. Now, not human as in the sense of, you know, Danny and, and Phil or whatever. You know, you, you, it would be more, more something out of, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or whatever, because we, we see things on a certain level, however they will interpret to us, not to be purely human intervention. These, these two guys walked in and stood at the end of my dad's bed, one on the, one on the left side and one on the right side, and, and stood almost like, almost like those images of knights who come in or waiting for the king to die. I was very conscious of this. You know, I couldn't, I'm not sure anybody else in the room would see it, but I could see it was very conscious. My dad at that time was in a coma. He was way out of it. I went in the next day and he'd come around and the first thing he said to me, he said, hey lad, that's who used to talk to me, he's a wonderful guy, bless his heart. He said, hey lad, he said, the strangest thing happened. I think it was yesterday, but I don't know because he, he was under the morphine. He said, but these two fellas walked in and they stood at the end of the bed there, tall fellas, one on the left and one on the right, exactly as I'd seen, but had never mentioned to my dad what it was, but he was very conscious that it was something that was not in the, in the touch-feel world, it was something beyond that world. Now, you say, what happened then? Well, he, he said these words, he said, he said, I thought they'd come for me. Now, he didn't say trembling, I thought they'd come for me like some, you know, demon dark thing. He was quite excited, he said, I thought they'd come for me. In his head, I know, he believed they were angelic beings. And um, the day that he died, which was a couple of days later, I was conscious that these two, whoever, had come in the room again, and within minutes, dad had gone. Now, you see, what was all that about? Even in the midst of that thing, there was a comfort in the beyond, in the other thing, in, na in the universe's nudge, in God's nudge to say, it's okay, I've got this, I've got you, it's okay. So tonight, I want you to let the nudges bring hope. I want you to let the hope bring trust. I want you to root yourself firmly in the love of God and to live by faith and not by sight and to trust the nudges. Let me pray. Father, may everything that you speak and the things that you show and the things you do and the nudges that come from around us bring us to the place where we see your kindness and love showing through, always bringing us beyond to the something else so that in all of our hearts we will know that the nudges are to tell us, no, there's something else. In troubled times there is life, in the driest bones there is joy, in a broken heart.
for being a part of Q-Search this afternoon. Now, our service is not yet over. For the next 30 minutes, there will be drinks and snacks served in the foyer, and we all have the opportunity to have a chat and discuss what's inspired us about today's message. If you're between the ages of 5 and 11 years old, then head through the doors either side of stage for 30 minutes of serious fun in Life Zone. Those of you 